my venture into medical started off in 1975 when I was uh, at high school. I got an accident and for a whole year I was stuck in a hospital. But having spent almost a year in the hospital, I decided I wanted to be a doctor really. And so I joined the medical school in 1979 and graduated in 1984. Started working as a doctor in 1984. With hindsight, I think I got infected around 1986, 85-86. Was that when I developed some signs which I now know are the signs of HIV like. So all that time from 85, 86 to 93 almost. I mean, through nine, eight, nine years without being detected. And yet I was a doctor. But in 1993, my wife, Margaret, had become quite ill. And so we advised to do an HIV test. I went in the HIV test, she was positive. And I was also positive because when I, also, when I did so, that is when I knew for sure that I had uh, HIV. And so it is until 1999. That's when I got um, a fifth attack of TB. And this was MDR TB, mild drug resistance TB. And then I developed uh, cancer called Kaposi sarcoma. Uh, I had sores in my mouth and even in my lungs, I could cough out blood. Uh, that was known as pulmonary Kaposi sarcoma, and it's a killer, very few for recover. And then at the same time, I developed meningitis which is inflammation of the, uh, the linings of the brain. So the three, TB, MDR TB, Kaposi sarcoma, and uh, meningitis. Each of them is a killer, and I had all of them at a go in 1999. And by 2003, I was sick again. Got another bout of TB. But what luckily around that time is when I came and I got a job with mild men. And in 2004, they had started receiving money for the PEPFA uh, program. And so I started receiving uh, free uh, uh, ARVs. And because now I could uh, have the supply more regularly and the uh, side effects were less, I started taking them well. And you can imagine from 2004 up to now, I have been on the same combination. And my viral load is suppressed all the time and I've never not been admitted again in hospital. We should learn from these okay, such painful experiences like I've gone through, but we can forget that there are people, for example, in Uganda who are still dying, and I'm sure in the other countries, in Uganda we're losing over 20,000 annually to AIDS-related causes. So we need to really look what kills these people, and it's mainly obstetric infections. What causes them obstetric infections? Because their CD4 count has come so low, CD4 count, I always tell my patients, is like your personal protection unit. Your PPU is so weak, the few who are there are sick themselves, so they, they can't protect you. We need to keep saying this. We cannot afford to forget the fact that people who are infected can actually quickly transition into advanced disease, even when they're on ARVs. If they don't swallow them, well, because of either side effects or stock outs because of poor funding or other things, so we need to put our act together and make sure that we look for every person who is infected with this disease and put them on good treatment and treat them well. My government and all other governments need to invest more into caring for the total person and not for the virus alone. Yeah, I, I think, and I like the word you use, thrive. I think I would like to look at myself as a thriver more than a survivor. Yeah, that we can thrive. We can thrive if we know what to do. But I'm here, I had less than 100 and I'm okay. I'm thriving and there are many people who are thriving. So don't write off people. People who have less than 100. I've seen poor who have five. Nobody has a list of who is going to die next. So I can live. So I live a day at a go, but I live as if I'm going to live for a lot of years. I'm now 65 and I'm hoping to live up to 90. But of course I live a day at a go. And that's the most important thing really.